Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss data mesh or data mess, separating reality from hype, sponsored today by Couchbase and Monte Carlo. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to know the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you'll find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of the session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to a Jeff for a brief word from our sponsor, Couchbase. Jeff, hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Thank you so much. And uh, I will uh, take over share for a second. Uh, I want to talk to everybody about one of the core problems that we're going to end up finding in these uh, data mesh architectures and uh, uh, offer some solutions, perhaps, as to how... Uh, they might be resolved when, uh, uh, um, as you consider what's you know been happening in the inside the market. So we see you know the need for delivering killer experiences uh, to your end user clientele or your field or your field service workers or whomever is actually logging into your your system. So I'm taking a very application oriented approach to uh, uh, to this particular problem space. So we wanna be able to develop really efficiently. We wanna deploy efficiently and effectively across clouds and support you know, much more modern kinds of capabilities that you might find um, in modern databases. But here, and he, the thing that we end up uh, seeing very, very frequently is there's four real reasons why people uh, come and talk to Couchbase at all. One is because you have applications uh, and your databases that are powering those applications are failing in performance. Or you need so, you know, a dramatically improved flexibility, uh, like perhaps you want to better personalize your application um, and your, uh, your relational database won't allow you to do that. Uh, third is mobility and the, the ability to move applications or push applications all the way to the edge uh, or beyond. And I'll show you a couple of ex examples of that in a second. Or drive down your overall cloud costs. And I'll show you um, why the, the, uh, uh, the ongoing use of multiple databases within an application or within an ar a, a data architecture is not only creating this let's say data mess uh, um, uh, sprawl in, in a data mesh, but is also uh, becoming more and more obsolete, right? That notion of, uh, uh, of using purpose-built databases uh, for particular tasks. So I wanna just let you know that Couchbase does live in your life every single day. Uh, your credit card transactions, there's a high likelihood that those are being managed by the FICO Falcon system and therefore Couchbase. Uh, if you've ever cruised on Princess Cruise Line over the last few years, uh, that cool little medallion that they give you that is your room key and your payment device, uh, that, you know, and then that also knows what your personalization, what your breakfast preferences are, what your kids like to do uh, at Carnival Cruise, that's, you know, that's Couchbase 2. Uh, your, um, your feed in your LinkedIn profile or, or in your LinkedIn uh, uh, environment, that's powered by Couchbase, as is your shopping experience when you're looking for off office supplies at or at companies like Staples. So you really are actually interacting with Couchbase on practically a daily basis. So here's what I'm what we're noticing in the market right now, and it, remember it's 2023, not 2011. Um, this data sprawl has has happened with messy mesh, meshes, as I'm kind of characterizing, um, which has created a lot of uh, both database management challenges as well as uh, uh, cost challenges. So having a cache or a NoSQL system to uh, manage your account profiles, but a relational database to manage transactions, or um, you know a different analytics system to uh, to manage your uh, uh, analytics, all of that has created the problem of you know, uh, uh, that we're seeing right now. But really, what you uh, ideally you would want to deploy a, mul a, a multi-model database that has these core capabilities built inside of it. Uh, and remember, Couchbase is built from the merger of MemcacheD and CouchDB. Those teams merged together and rewrote a brand new database called Couchbase. It's really the original multi-model database with an integrated cache and key value access uh, uh, to your data, as well as the flexibility of being able to you know, manipulate or change 
exchange, a JSON data store. You get relational capabilities like acid transactions and joins across document collections. Uh, you get full text search. You get analytics built in. You get eventing capabilities built in. And you get geographic replication and synchronization also built in for mobility sake. And what we're seeing right now is uh, one of the things I want to uh, talk to uh, Donna about is the notion of using JSON not only as the vehicle that contains the you know, your, your your data uh, you know, your specific data, but also as a payload for metadata in, in managing a data mesh or a data catalog. Right, those two things can be combined, and we see uh, uh, areas where this might be really really interesting looking ahead. Of course, Couchbase, the other advantage that we offer is we're super easy. If you know SQL, then you already know how to use Couchbase. Our query language is called SQL++. We used to call it Nickel, uh, but that it, it includes joins, subqueries, nested objects, all of the things you would expect. And it, you know, it, it reads exactly as uh, SQL does. So the last thing I want to talk about real quick is the uh, upswing in uh, the, uh, the need for offline first or mobile applications for field service, for utility work, for you know, rest your, your uh, uh, QR code based menus, or for mobile pop up clinics. And that this whole notion of supporting you know, data at the edge is a mesh problem that we're going to see perpetuate uh, in the future. So uh, closing up, you know, integrated capabilities of the customer, you get better release cycles, less duplication, you can scale more easily, you get uh, uh, easier data catalog management, et cetera, all within the Couchbase environment. So Shannon, I think that concludes my particular prepared remarks and I'm looking forward to the rest of the event. Great, Jeff, thank you so much. Very interesting. And if you, thanks for kicking us off. If you have questions for Jeff about Couchbase, you may submit your questions in the Q&A as he'll be joining us in the Q&A portion of the webinar at the end. And now let me turn over to Shane for a brief word from our second sponsor, Monte Carlo. Shane, hello and welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, so I'm gonna give a, a very brief overview of Monte Carlo. Um, Monte Carlo is the, the, the creator of the data observability category. Um, we've recently released this book on data quality fundamentals. Um, I'm the field CTO at Monte Carlo. I've uh, been here since last year. And prior to that, I ran data at the New York Times for nine years from 2013 to 2021. Uh, and we're a Series D startup with uh, hundreds of customers now uh, in just the, the couple of years we've been operating. Um, what the problem is that the Monte Carlo is solving uh, is one that we refer to as data downtime. Data downtime is periods of time when your data is missing, erroneous, late, or otherwise, um, uh, you know, in error and, and unable to be used. And the real problem with data downtime that you see at, at companies of all sizes is that the data producers who own the source systems can't see downstream. They don't know when they're making changes, who those changes can impact, um, what sort of reports are built off of the data from their environments. Um, the analysts or the data scientists at the end of this chain, the data consumers often can't see upstream. So they um, don't know when they find an error, if it's actually an insight or if it's uh, an error in a pipeline. And then data engineers tend to be caught in the middle. They own the data platform. They own the warehouse and the lakes and, and much of the data in it. Um, and they can't predict all the ways that data will break. Um, and so typically in the past, this was solved via manual testing. Um, and we've seen that manual testing barely covers 10% of the space. Uh, and what you generally find is your issues, your data incidents are found by downstream consumers, uh, and it results in a loss of trust in data. Um, and so the, the consequences, I often talk about this in terms of this chart, but the consequences uh, can be trivial, uh, lost engineering time, um, but we do see that about 30 to 50% of engineering time is lost to, to data incidents, um, but they scale up to revenue losses for the business, loss of reputation and loss of trust. This is particularly big in data mesh cultures and, and a lot of Monte Carlo's customers are at various stages of data mesh rollout um, where you're trying to build trust in data across a decentralized rollout. Um, and so you need a, a self-service platform, a self-service data platform that includes observability and allows you to build trust in data and assign accountability across the organization. 
Um, and so the way Monte Carlo solves this, um, you know, we've typically found across these hundreds of customers that data downtime incidents look similar. They include things like, is the data up to date? Uh, are their values suspiciously high? Are there too many nulls, duplicate IDs? Uh, and so we wrap it up in these five pillars of observability. Um, these uh, include freshness, volume, quality, schema, and lineage to bring it all together and allow you to see upstream and downstream to efficiently resolve issues in data. And so this is essentially what a data observability platform does. It allows you to use those five pillars in the background, collecting metadata, logs, and metrics to start to detect uh, issues in the data using machine learning based on what you see with various data products to be able to find anomalies of freshness, volume, um, dimensional changes in the data or changes in mean. Um, then the tools to actually resolve those, those problems in the data through automated lineage, impact assessment, um, and various tools for root cause analysis. And finally, to be able to prevent uh, data incidents. Um, we have things like circuit breakers and schema change notifications that help in that regard. Um, and so, as I mentioned, probably about a third of our customers are involved in some form of data mesh. We have very large customers like Roche Diagnostics, who are kind of the poster child for data mesh, and we're, we're supporting that journey for them. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. And thanks to, uh, and if you have questions for Shane or about Monte Carlo, again, feel free to put them in the Q&A portion as he'll be joining us as well at the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Thanks to both Couchbase and to Monte Carlo for sponsoring today's webinar to help make it happen. And now let me introduce the speaker for the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the managing director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna, get her presentation started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Thank you. And thanks for the uh, Jeff and Shane as well. Some really interesting presentations and always a pleasure to, to join these. So if, if anyone is new to, to this session and hasn't joined us before, it is a monthly webinar. Um, you can see some of the ones in the past. If you've missed them, Dataversity keeps all of them. Um, on their website, so you can catch all the replays, and hopefully some of these other topics are interesting to you if you want to catch some additional ones throughout the year. Um, but the topic for today is data mesh, um, and kind of if you've you know, seen the abstract, probably because you came onto this webinar, um, there's a lot of terms that go around, and I, I will talk more about that. Um, there's data mesh, there's data fabric, right? And and I think you know a lot of these promises are this is the next big thing. Um, so I want to start, you know, again, what are we talking about when we talk about these terms? Because if we are kind of a business-centric data architect, words mean things, and we're very, you know, semantics are important. Um, but really more importantly, and as some of the previous speakers kind of touched on, how does the data mesh approach fit in today's modern data architecture? And then also, um, you know, how does it fit into some of the more fundamental approaches we've been doing for a long time, things like master data, data quality, and data governance, which has been sort of top of mind and some of the criticisms around uh, data mesh. So we'll talk, are those founded, or are they not? So hopefully, as with all the other webinars, I try to make it real. Um, and what does this mean in the real world? And if you're trying to make a decision, and what do these words mean? And should I use them? And does it make sense for my organization? So hopefully, this will maybe not provide the final answer, but give you some ideas or some food for thought. Um, so back to the core definitions. Um, there is data mesh, and that's what we're talking about today. Um, kind of the the, the similar words, kind of in some cases, similar functionality, but a bit of a different meaning. I think of data mesh is more broadly, not only the idea, as some of the previous speakers mentioned, um, of this idea of localized data management, domain-based uh, authority of data, but it's also a more of a cultural and organizational shift and, and kind of a foundational different way of thinking. Um, so, you know, do, data assets are organized in data domains, subject matter experts kind of use those patterns and define them and create data products. Um, and some of that is technological, technological, there we go. Uh, Tim, some of that is technology um, and some of it is technology uh, and, and people. So we'll kind of go through both of those. Um, when we look at the data fabric, um, and we won't be covering that on this 
call, but that is, and it could, you know, a lot of people do have different definitions, um, but that really is more of a data integration style, you know, whether that is a, a knowledge graph or that is a um, virtualization mechanism, et cetera. And then again, they're related, um, but we are going to talk more about the data mesh and its proper form today. Um, and I'm giving credit to the Gartner Data Dictionary. I use theirs a lot. They always tend to have some good definitions, so I am a fan. But data mesh, data fabric, uh, don't get me started. Uh, we have lakes now and ponds and data mesh made of fabric. We'll have data crochet and data needlepoint and who knows next. <laughs> But for, for now, these are the two terms we're using. So it kind of leads into this. So um, I, I do want to kind of put it into what we're talking about today. So many of you may have heard Zamak Dagani, who's been a lot of the kind of the founder of Data Mesh. And I'm not doing an on ad hominem <laughs> attack or um, anything on, on Zamak, but um, we kind of do that in the industry of the Bill Inman model and the... Um, Right, the, the Kimball model. And so in a way, her name, and she's uh, launched a lot of this, I'm going, and also because there's been so many different definitions, I'm going to use hers because everybody seems to take a thought and then kind of evolve it. So I tried to go back to source as I was going through this. Um, very well-spoken, very intelligent woman. Some of the issues I have is with language, and she's the first one to say um, so this is from one of, one of her webinars, um, and she quoted Fellini saying, language is a different uh, vision of life. And then she went on to say, is we need to create a new language, and that many of these concepts exist already, but we need new names. And I say, please, no, we do not need new names for the same thing. And I think one of the problems we have in the industry is, is are we innovating or are we creating new names uh, for things? And I think we, some of us in data architecture, spend so much time trying to understand the names of things and the name, meaning of things for a, you know, our organization or for a client or for consultants. Um, and, and to, we want to be really careful about our, our wording. Um, and then the other one is more, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm maybe in a, a little vent mode today, but we tend to do that in this industry of, hey, there's a new product and everything that came before it is terrible, right? Or or do we do that just in society? Oh, that's old or that's not, that's out of date or it's not modern, it's not hip, it's not new. Like, what do those even mean? So I sort of was on a roll the other evening and I, I kind of listened to some of these webinars and just started writing down words of what were words used for, I think a loosely defined old school, which is sort of data lakes and data warehouses, which mostly focused on data lake uh, from a lot of the, the conversation and words, um, and then comparing it to this new um, the, this new uh, paradigm of of data mesh. And so, in the old world, data was a byproduct and not a product. I mean, that's clever. It's nice, nice where we should treat data as a product. But I, I think I'd be reluctant to say that anyone who's doing a data warehouse or a data lake sees data as a byproduct. You know, maybe. Maybe you could argue it's being managed inefficiently or not modern, but it's certainly not a byproduct. It's certainly a first order product, or just it's, it's, rigid, it's fragile, it's broken, it's disconnected, there's tension, it's full of friction. And my very favorite one, everyone is unhappy. That just seems broad, right? And if you look to the right, if you're looking at data mesh, it's a delightful experience, which is this paradigm shift with a lower cognitive load with a decentralized social technological approach. Um, Great words, but I'm almost not sure what some of these means. We're convergent or intelligently empowered ecosystem of high order to value with polyglot app date data points focused on an architectural quantum. So these are all great. I mean, I guess very, very well spoken you know, human being, but I, I'm, I'm trying to get my brain around what concrete things these offer. And there are concrete things. I will go through that. But I did find a lot of word salad and, and just I, I we do that in an industry. Are we just creating more buzzwords? Um, so I want to kind of break that down and be a realistic of you know, what are we what are we solving and what, how much of this is new? Um, you know, are we ingesting data or are we serving data? There may be some you know technical differences there, or are we just wordsmithing? Right, that's a great idea. We're serving things to our customers. We're treating data as a product. That um, is true. And I, and to be fair, I think that's a bit of what she's saying. Of we need to think of data in a different way. It's a first order product. You know, we we do so much of treating our products and our customers. Why don't we think of data that same way? That I get, that I agree with. I agree that we should have a delightful experience with a lower cognitive load. I just, I do think, and a lot, of, and part of it, again, I'm not attacking so much because she's super smart. A lot of it is people take these definitions and create their own. So trying to just really understand what are we talking about when we're talking about a new pattern, what it solves and what, what some of the risks might be. So I might've gone off on my own slight tangent here, but felt the need to say that because I just, as we go through, what are we solving and what words are we using is super, super important. So I do have a rant. <laughs> Let's keep it simple. My, my nerd joke here is, is shoe obfuscation. 
um, which basically is a really fancy word of saying, you know, please don't use big words to overcomplicate simple terms, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, if we can if we can use a simple word that we all understand, please keep doing that. I saw this in a bumper sticker a few years ago, where near where I live, where I guess there's a lot of nerdy people, and at least in my mind, that cracked me up. But that, that I feel like we're doing a little bit of this. Are we, you know, obfuscating simple terms and and so let's eschew obfuscation, please. Um, so uh, that said, it is very well. Uh, there are sort of sort of standard. And again, I'm, I'm using a full disclosure, a lot of uh, pictures and, and, and really trying to go back to her core principles so that I don't mix it with other people's sort of versions of there are other versions of mesh and some people mix mesh and fabric and all that. So I just thought for this presentation, let's go back to some of these four core principles uh, that she came up with. So. The, the main objective is to create this foundation to get value from data at scale, which is, you know, as the previous speakers mentioned, is a problem. We're getting more and more data. So some of the four core principles are this idea of domain ownership. Uh, if, you know, folks are in a particular domain, they're the best people to manage it and, and curate it and treat it like a product. And that data is a product. It's not a byproduct. Again, I agree uh, with that. It shouldn't be something you do, you know, as an afterthought, it should be the thought. Um, and this idea of providing a self-service data platform so that consumers of this product of the domain can see it easily and, and understandably and have the metadata and, and all of the right things around it, because this is a nicely just produced product, just like you would produce a product to your customer. You know, you wouldn't do that in a sloppy way or and you want them coming back for more. All of that. that I definitely agree with that. And this idea of federated computational governance. So you do have kind of that distributed approach. Uh, to managing these data. And you can see her graphic on the right uh, that really kind of explains that a little bit more. So we'll kind of go through uh, some of these. Um, so again, this idea of domains is, is sort of core to a lot of what we're talking about with MESH and um, a bit of what a lot of folks are pushing back on a little bit. And are we being fair? Are we overthinking? Um, but the primary principle is that data, particularly anal analytics, she does put a big focus on analytic data, is is organized and managed in these ideas of domains. Um, her, one of the summaries she gave is like, you, you know what a domain is? It's the stuff that runs your business, right? We can all say that. You can see things on the right, you know, marketing, sales, HR. Um, some of her examples use something like a podcast company and this, you know, podcasts and media and things. Whatever your company is running, those and, and, and this me uh, methodology are your domain. So they could be an organizational unit, a business function, kind of a logical data domain like, um, customer, which is uh, maybe something that's on your conceptual data model. Um, I'll go into that more. I I find that a little bit loose, um, and but I'm a big nerd, so <laughs> take that as it is. Um, um, it's just kind of a loose definition of a, a grouping of things where you have an owner. And then each domain would have a formal data ownership. And these are the producers of data, and they are held responsible for those different data areas to publish it for others in that self-service way. Um, that includes things like metadata. Um, so you don't just put out the data, good, good luck to you, right? You do have to have that metadata and publish it wrapped in a nice bow for other people as well. Um, and, and again, I do feel that's a bit of a, a loosely defined contact. Again, when I think of these things, I think what is the marketing might be a department, right? And finance might be a department. Um, selling might be a process and product might be more of a data area or a a noun, right? So I think more important um, in this methodology is more, you know, these are the areas of the business where there's an owner or owner around them. The other big area, if you see the quote at the bottom, you know, does get into the, you know, not to only hit, you know, the idea of words mean different things, but the idea is instead of flowing the data into this big centrally owned data lake or data warehouse or data platform, it's more of that service model where the do domains host and serve their data sets in a consumable way to publish out to other people, right? So don't build the one big monolithic application, um, bring it closer to its source. And the people who know the data are publishing the data. So marketing or, you know, selling or distribution or any of these examples that are given. Um, so that, that's kind of that core of, of owning the domain and then being a product owner in a way of, of that domain. So what is a data product? And, um, and again, in the data mist words, is that ar architecture, ar ar I can talk today, an architecture quantum, right? It's the smallest piece of an architecture that can be independently deployed in this kind of hub spoke model sort of thing. So um, in her mind, it isn't just the data, it's the metadata, it's the infrastructure and some code to access it. Um, so, you know, those polyglot output data points. So, you know, maybe even API that someone can get and, and produce the data. It's not enough to produce 
the data. Um, you also need to make it consumable and publishable. But the idea of this data product is that that smallest piece of thing um, that you can publish out. Um, and, and, and one of the nice things about thinking of data as a, as a product, um, and, I, and I've used this analogy myself, um, is that there's a, just like there's a product life cycle, there's a data life cycle, and not just, you know, when is it created and destroyed, but, you know, how are we thinking of this from a data request? Why are we doing it? What's the value of this data? How do I manage it? How do I make it consumable and, and something that people want to, to use, right? And, and again, it's that idea of ownership and nurturing and, and, and treating it just like you would treat your, your product, um, understand it as high quality, as trusted, as meaningful, and people want to come back for more, you know, without being corny. Um, I, I think that aspect uh, does make sense. Treat data, if it, you know, we all say data is an asset, and yes, you manage, manage financial assets. This kind of takes it one step further of, you know, well, we also, even a financial company sells products, financial products, right? We, you know, product, customer, that type of thing is a nice way to kind of Put, put the onus on the producer and the manager of that data uh, to really publish it out in the right way. Um, the other idea is this idea of self-serve. And again, it's not, not enough just to build the data. You want to build it so that they will come, right? And and and, and hide the complexity, you know, typical self-service, even if you're doing, you know, Power BI, you probably understand that, right? That, but this is a bit different than that, right? It's hiding the complexity, but in a consumable way that's almost your digital storefront. Um, that, that people can self-serve from that platform, you know, whether it's code um, or infrastructure, or you need to provide all of those different areas to make it consumable. Um, the other idea of, of this uh, data mess is that it is a federated approach. Again, this isn't this one big monolithic data set, uh, although we'll get to that. She does say that there's a place for that, that in some ways a data lake or a data warehouse could be a node on the mesh. It's just another, you know, not, not that you never do a warehouse, um, but that is a a product that may be consumable by other people, just like finance may be um, a domain that's publishing out finance data, right? So this idea is not only, again, um, the, the paradigm here is not just that it's a technical thing, but it's also a culture change and a data governance paradigm. Um, so some of the... Um, the the issues that data mesh was trying to solve, and I, I, I have a bit of issues with this because I don't know if the core fundamentals are true, but that traditional data governance is too centralized. It stifles innovation and change. Um, again, all those things that those, those nasty words in the beginning that it's stiff um, and it's, you know, everyone's unhappy and, and nothing gets done. I, I'm not, that's not a fair definition of governance, right? I think most governance do have many approaches, whether it aligns with a business process or a um, organization, or there's a federated approaches to governance, and there's some things are centralized. You know, I, I, I guess that's part of my issue is you're not setting up a core um, correct assumption of something you're you're, you're criticizing, right? So I, I do think governance, and partly because I do do a lot of it, as, as do a lot of people in um, data diversity. Yeah, you don't want your data governance to be stifling and too centralized and too stiff. But that wouldn't be a, a core definition of what data governance is, right? Um, that said, I don't want to be unfair to data mesh either, because, and again, I, I tried to go back to source and, and go everything I, most things I published here were from Zamak herself, because I've heard a lot of criticism of mesh, and I want to make sure I'm saying the same thing that she said, right? I don't think she said no global governance and no standards, right? Because that's not going to work either right so it, it's it's putting putting the domain ownership in the domain where it makes sense and then there are these sort of ideas of global governance and open standards and, and, and interoperability um and you and you can see some of the quotes here on the right is that you know how do you there is some effective correlation across domains and there are some standards uh, across these polyglot domain data sets um and my my favorite word um is this idea of identifying polysemes across different domains. I, I guess for us, that, that's a word with different meaning. What do we mean by customer? What do we mean by a region? Um, so we've been doing that for a long time. It's a great word, um, but the, that is some of the core things that data governance does, right? So how do we understand the same term? And I think that's some of the criticisms of, of MeSH is, and, and happy to, to discuss this because she doesn't say do none of it, right? She does say there are things that are kind of managed across domains, but then you get into a little bit of a circle that is kind of that global governance, right? So, I mean, but let's not let wordsmith anything. And some some things are, are you know, domain owned and, and some things are, are you know, more of a global governance, right? 
And then I did uh, pull up a quote there. These are all quotes from um, some of her writing, which was, you know, where does the data lake or data warehouse fit? There's an, a node on the mesh. So it's not that you never ever build one. Um, it isn't the only solution. And I'd certainly agree with that. I mean, there's still more, many more patterns uh, out there as well. Um, but I do have some issues with uh, data mess as I have defined it or, or, or from some of the writings that I've seen from her. I do think the criticism of, of centralized data governance or just data governance where everything is rigid, rigid um, and everything goes through the central committee uh, or some of the things I heard or everything, you know, centralized slows everything down. That's just not what governance is, right? <laughs> I mean, certain things need to be, how do we define a total sales um, for the company that we send to the, you know, annual report? We kind of got to agree on that. You know, you don't, everyone doesn't, even finance doesn't define that. That's a cross-functional thing. Or how do we define patient data that goes across all the domains of a hospital, right? Um, and then if you say patient's a domain, then isn't that kind of a centralized data governance, right? So I, I, I just starting with saying data governance is rigid and everything goes through a central committee, just I don't think is a fair assumption of the governance. There's many models. Um, some things are global, some things are local. And then you have to just make that decision across governance of, of when it makes sense. You don't want to undergovern and you don't want to overgovern. Um, I think there's a fear with with data mesh of undergoverning some of the things by, you know, are we creating more silos, I guess? And I'm not the only one saying this, and we could be unfair, right? But are, are we creating more silos by these domain based? You know, where does that collaboration go? Because that, that is some of the hard stuff you need to do to get the data right, right? And and just by saying everyone manages their own thing. Is that the other extreme that needs to address? Right, that's kind of the, the question there. Um, I muted myself. That was great. Um, is this idea of data domains? And and I kind of maybe you could criticize me. I'm a bit of a purist here, but I'm a, I'm a purist for a reason. When I say a data domain, what do we mean? Is, is it a data domain like customer? product, like something you see in a data model? Is it a process? Is it an organization? Is it a business capability? And I think it matters because it matters to governance. It matters how it fits in with the organization, you know, and what, what it means to be, if, if I'm if I'm the data owner of HR, if I'm the data owner of sales, who owns customer? What about marketing? What if they're the domain owner of sales? All right, and, and maybe that's some of these, um, you know, uh, areas that she said, what, I, mean, I actually forgot the, the word, these polysemes that sort of go across um, domains. But again, that's that's cross-functional data governance, right? So that kind of breaks some of the owning a product, right? Um, so, so some things make sense. If I'm trying to say, I don't know, total marketing campaigns for customers, maybe that, that's certainly marketing. If it's total sales by customers, that's certainly sales, right? So again, it's a, it's a both and, I, I guess. And I and I think folks get attention by making an extreme on either side. Maybe I'm doing that myself, right? But I, I do think uh, I like to be very clear on what we mean by a data domain, because that also fits into your governance model. Am I owning a data area? Um, and I need cross, if, I'm, if I'm owning customer, I, I, I better get kind of cross-functional um, input from sales, marketing, support, all the things that support a customer. Um, but if I'm an, an org centric, then I guess I would own everything around finance or HR, right? And that, that kind of has a different set of rules around it. So not the, the fact that necessarily domains or, or that concept of kind of localized um, ownership, I, I, I like to just be a little clearer with what words mean um, and, and kind of just be clear because it has an effect on how you govern and, and what kind of data we're even talking about. Um, the next one, I, I have an issue with this idea of an architectural quantum, uh, because to me that that's in this the lowest level architectural item. And I would argue that if data is the product, it, data itself is the architectural quantum. And I realize I'm sounding totally nerdy with these words, but um, you know, your actual data objects, a customer or a product, or even the critical data elements within a um a data object like customer email or product number, right? Uh, ma managing some of that. Who, if we need to change a product number, who makes that decision? Um, is it only the product management team? Does sales have a, you know, does you know the shipment company <laughs> have a have a say, right? So I think you do that. To me, the idea of a, 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 of a domain is certainly not the architectural quantum, and I I think that sort of that's where some of these issues. I think it was these cross functional data areas kind of kind of break down because there are this is some of the hard stuff you really need to to, to focus on um I've, I've seen both and again I, a lot of the work it is this kind of an idea of an analytical focus uh, and and that is a lot of the the use cases of kind of publishing out for analytics and 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 that sort of thing 
especially when we're talking about data governance, um, true ownership and accountability, I think, does come into the operational data. Well, who's creating it, um, who, who's managing it, and who is kind of accountable for the data quality. And you want to be really clear that th those are different things and maybe related things. Um, and, and, and focusing as much on the operational data, which is kind of why when I look at the data domain, I also look at process, who owns the process around entering patient data and, and who touches the data at each stage of the process or product data, right? I, I think having that view across, and yeah, that's kind of an enterprise architecture focus, which maybe folks consider old fashioned, I consider it fundamental because it really gets down to really understanding the business. And yes, absolutely, you don't just have one big committee that manages everything. But aside from that, there's a whole lot of nuance of how you get that right, that it is federated. Federated takes you know some thought. How does the company run? Is it is it by business process? And we need to have owners for that. Is it really about business capability? Is it by data domain that someone really can own in product data and, and publish it out? Um, or pieces of product data, right? Thinking through that is is, is kind of complex. And I, I just thought there was some loose thinking around um, some of these concepts. Um, the other area is the socio-technical, um, to use the mesh words approach. Um, and I can tell I'm bitter about this, that, that a lot of the words, and it wasn't just one webinar that I was listening to or one paper that she had written. I, I really tried to be pure to this. I heard a lot of these words. Uh, enterprise data management is full of friction, and everyone is unhappy. I'm not unhappy. I do enterprise data management. Um, but here's my wh where I push back with that. Um, friction is a good thing. It takes friction to light a fire, to use my own corny thing, right? If you're not having these hard cross-functional conversations to resolve these polysemes or architectural quanta, um, you're, you're simply avoiding the hard issues, right? And I'm quoting a, another Jadiversity speaker, um, Karen Lopez, data is a representation of the real world. If you want your data to be simple, make the world simple and get back to me, right? That that is it too easy? And I'm open to discussion. That's why we're here. And I, I will lose leave time for for Q and A. You know, to say, are we recreating the silos? Right, right. That it would be really nice if finance owned finance and sales owned sales and and marketing owned marketing. But then where does customer fit? What do we? How do we define a customer? And yes, we. We sound crazy and it takes a long time to define that, but that's because these are the core quantum, quanta <laughs> of our business. And the, that the friction is there for a reason, right? Because people are using it differently. And if you don't have those conversations, um, you're gonna just find these problems later, right? So um, yeah, friction is a good thing. If you're in a company and no one ever questions anyone in a meeting, does that mean that company's working really well? Or, or really hiding things, like a couple that never fights or never disagrees um, in a relationship, is that healthy um, or are things being avoided? Maybe, maybe everyone disagrees with everything. I think that's pretty rare. So I, I think the idea of friction is a good thing and, and, and data is hard, right? So you don't wanna hide that and you wanna promote that and call it out. Um, and of course, th that doesn't mean one committee makes the decision to avoid friction, um, but at the same time, you don't wanna over federate either. That's kind of the art and science of, of data governance. Um, so. We, we in our practice spend a lot of time with data governance. And I'm on my own little soapbox here, but there's a lot of ways to either manage a, manage data governance if we're talking about the governance aspect of Mesh. Um, sometimes it's process owner, you know, who's looking at data from the order to cast perspective or the customer onboarding, you know, or customer onboarding versus court, customer payment versus customer support rep, right? All these different areas touch data in a different way. Great example we just had was. Um, a uh, big manufacturing company and they had a lot of issues with their data and, and payment terms, for example, um, would be changed and they weren't sure where, but some people had 60 day payment terms, some people had 30 day payment terms for the same customer. And you can imagine trying to forecast and everything, that was a, a huge problem. We, we kind of mapped out the business process and the people in the different swim lanes or your different, maybe those are your domains, uh, kind of said, well, you change it in this part of the process, I change it downstream here. I didn't know you were doing it. And it really was just the processes were in conflict. So that, that fixed, it, fixed it a data problem by looking at process, right? Sometimes it really is a system centric that the next one, the second one in, not a fan of that. I don't think it should be a, a technology centric, but sometimes something like PeopleSoft is so embedded um, in, in your organization, you need it, or these might be your technical data stewards, right? Sometimes it is by who owns customer or supply, or, may, or maybe your, um, maybe something smaller like location or regions or, or 
I don't know, sales hierarchies, maybe that is owned by sales, right? Or regions, things like that. So, so sometimes it is a domain centric approach. Sometimes it is by org. Who's looking at sales? Who's looking at Omega sales versus US sales versus Latin America sales? Um, that might be an org centric approach. And then I like to look at also just capabilities. Orgs change, capabilities don't. What are the core capabilities that run our company, whether it's supply chain, finance, sales, which is different than the names of those orgs or how they might be organized. And really, in real life, it's generally a combination of all of these. Who looks at customer across supply chain, uh, across order to cash, and who looks at suppliers across, you know, payment or all, all of that. So that, that's what makes it tricky. And that is part of the friction <laughs> that makes it hard. Um, and, and just throwing out there, this is not the only way either. Um, but um, I mean, this idea of having kind of domains of data that, that aren't centralized is kind of an, I'm going to kind of a more of a very foundational traditional model that can also solve that, right? It doesn't uh, need to go to a quote mesh, like good old fashioned, love people love to hate the enterprise data warehouse, right? You can have this idea of a, a centralized, maybe this is one of the, the nodes on the, on the mesh. What is, uh, I'm a university, right? What's the total number of enrolled students? We kind of need that because it gets published to US News and World Report and whatever that's like, we cannot, everyone cannot decide that. That is maybe your centralized committee that does that. But you don't tell graduate students and their mart of, you know, what's the total number of graduate students, or maybe we want to know for faculty research, what are the number of publications per student by faculty, right? Or maybe you don't even want it in a relational database. Maybe it's kind of, you know, more of a time series data to do for institutional research. What, what success factors help students over time, right? So not everything is in a relational database or even a dimensional, or it could be flattened out. It could be a graph. It could be a lot of things. So this idea of we have some centralized analysis and some localized analysis is, is kind of a thing that's been around. Um, but I think what's missed also often in MESH is this idea uh, towards the bottom of these uh, MASH, these core quanta, I would say. I would think these are your, your core um, architectural quantum things. Um, your, your master data, or some of them at least, your master data, your reference data that you have you have student data, you have location data, you have faculty. Once you, you sort of manage those as first order things, they're your reusable components, whether it's in your enterprise data warehouse or your, your data mart or the source systems, right? So this idea that I somebody is looking or a team or a, a, a domain of people is looking at student and it also can, can push back the source system so that when I'm in my registration system, it's the same student across. That's hard. There's a whole lot of friction doing that, but that really gets to kind of that data quality. And there's data governance and accountability across, across all of that and within all of that. So of course the faculty research team is gonna look at their faculty research. They own that, they're the domain owners of that. They're not the domain owners of total number of enrolled students for US, US enrolled report. You know, you, and no one can pit, tell institutional research how they wanna format their data for longitudinal data analysis, right? That's their decision. So, so I, I think by nature, yes, there are localized ownership. There's some centralized ownership. Uh, but there's also some core architectural quanta that always gets left out of the conversation, which is the data itself. How do we manage student? How do, what do we call a location? Is that a region? Is that a campus? Is that, you know, all of those friction <laughs> words um, mean something. If we don't agree and have that friction of what we mean by location, um, the facilities person thinks that's a building and the enterprise people think that's a country. They want to see how many foreign students and graduate students thinks that's a campus, right? I mean, and we're all just talking different words for different things and that's what you want to avoid right so that's that's a bit of this idea of federated isn't new and this maybe not be a federated approach right but this idea of localized knowledge and, and kind of centralized knowledge living together um i'm fine with but you still have certain things that you need to have as those core quanta with your data that's the think of the data data is a product that i agree with but i think it's at a lower level it's it, and either at the measure level who owns the measure or who owns the core data itself or et cetera, et cetera, or it could be, you know, streaming data and other things. I mean, another example is this idea of public open data sets. This is a great example of data as a product and people owning it and publishing it and treating it as a product, right? So, you know, the, the Department of Agriculture in the U.S. has the Fiends, Feed Grains database. I love the pun database. What's the grain of the grain database? <laughs> is, it, is it barley? All right, nerd joke. Um, anyway, but, but they... The, who am I to say, you know, how many grains were um, produced each year by corn, by grain, by barley, right? They own it, they publish it, they produce it, they they provide a seamless product for people to consume in different ways. Uh, it could be a, a node on one of your hubs, external data can be it too. So again, this idea is not a bad idea. Um, there's, there's other ways to look at it. 
as well. And I think treating it as a product is, is, is a great idea. Um, it just doesn't always need particularly mesh. Um, all right, I'm on my final rant before I go. I, I do get sort of bitter of folks saying, well, you know, data work, enterprise data management, it's hard and they've failed so many times over the 20 years. And then this new thing that we just launched has none of these failures. Well, you know, Michael Phelps, the US uh, world medal swimmer has lost more swimming races than I have. I, Donna Burbank, have never lost a swimming race. I've also never competed in one. Right? So, so, I mean, the fact that data warehousing and enterprise data management have been around for 20 years says something. And yes, there have been many failures. There have been many successes, right? 90% of all businesses that start up fail. Does that mean we don't ever start businesses or is starting a business hard, right? I don't think we, we necessarily want to get away with the idea of starting a business. So, yes, I'm coming full circle and inventing a little bit. Um, but I, it, it's not just mesh. A lot of folks do that. Well, we, we don't need a warehouse anymore. We have real-time data streaming. Completely different use case. <laughs> Right. Um, Real-time data streaming is great for the right use case. Um, doesn't mean you have to kind of smosh what was there before. So with that final rant, um, I do want to kind of stress that, yes, data mesh does have some core principles of, of data ownership, domain ownership, having data as a product, and having this idea of self-service and this idea of not only federated compute, computational governance, uh, but also federated kind of ownership and, and um, governance, which is a big part of this idea of mesh, again, it's a socio-technical approach. It isn't just a technology. Um, maybe that's more of a data fabric. It is this idea of thinking differently about data, promoting data as a first order thing, and working together with these idea of data meshes, um, the data domains to work together. Um, so again, that those are the great. There's some definitely some good pieces of that. I do think there's some misalignment with some of the data management core principles like data governance best practices. Let's at least have common idea of what we mean by governance. Um, and it isn't just one monolithic thing. Um, things like master data management, I think should be part of the conversation of data as a first order, truly as a first order product. The product is product data or customer data or region data, right? Um, and, and I do think this idea of you do need a certain amount of enterprise focus to create that cross-functional friction. Everything shouldn't be friction. If it's truly your data, you should be able to own it. Totally agreed. Uh, but don't forget that some of that friction is good because those are the hard parts of the cross-functional data integration that we, we really need to run the business. So with that, I did leave time for questions. Um, I want to open it up um, to Shannon. Um, while we do that, just a little call out to next month's uh, webinar and a reminder, if you need help, we do this for a living. So over to you, Shannon. Donna, thank you so much. And I invite Shane and Jeff to join us in this Q&A. Just diving right in here. Um, lots of great questions coming in around this. So isn't this similar to quote unquote Spotify model of agile where organization is done using domain squad, product area, et cetera, and that domain squad product area is responsible for the data end to end? I think that's a fair uh, assumption. In fact, one of the examples she used is kind of a Spotify type company. Right, um, and that and that may make sense of that. You know, you you are the owner of this domain. You're the product owner of this domain. She does use some agile type terminology like product owner. Um, and yeah, I, and I think in my in my mind that's a that's a good analogy. But open to what Jeff and Shane think as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add. This is Shane. Um, I think the the Spotify organization model of aligning cross functional teams against sort of domains and objectives is almost like a necessary uh, operating model to support something like a data mesh because you need to have the the data the sort of full stack data talent uh, embedded in the different business domains and so I, I think it's an org model like that is definitely supportive of this approach and and probably a necessary enabler yeah i'm going to say yes <laughs> there you go <laughs> I love it. Uh, is it true that data mesh hasn't any guidelines or techniques for achieving semantic interoperability? Um, yes. Um, and let me go back because I always mess up that word. Um, so she again, I I, I don't want to misstate um, mesh either so so there is a bit of both metadata and maybe that gets into some of the, the json conversation that uh, jeff wanted to have uh so there, there's a, a format of how we can have common 
uh, platforms. And there is, it's these polycenes. There you go. There's a great word for an ex party. Um, is that there are some um, common terms across in there. And she does have a place for this global governance and standards to enable interoperability. I don't see that being drilled into as much as I'd like to see, because I think that's the friction, right? Uh, but it's not avoided. It's not like it's there at all. So there is a place for it. And this is how I saw it just described, but uh, open to Jeff and Shane's thoughts. Yeah, I, I, well, I was going to say, I, I, I think that that's, um, we're, we're, we're still just such a far way out. Um, but the the suggestion, because I've been with many of the the, the analyst peers that, uh, that, you, that you know as well, uh, that I've been talking to about, you know, JSON as a vehicle to be this arbiter of what the data payload is, right? You could you could say this customer record in this system looks like, you know, is is called uh, customer ID, but in this other system, it's called ID, right? Um, that that whole notion of of, of being able to um, uh, having something flexible enough that you can keep modifying it to keep up with whatever new systems you're adding or whatever new um, uh, analyses or, or other tools that you're trying to talk to. Um, I think there's I think there's some room there for something like uh, uh, JSON as a structure for it, but uh, I still haven't even seen folks uh, tackle this to, to, to that big a degree yet. Yeah, Shane, your thoughts? Yeah, I'll just add, I, I'm seeing sort of two flavors of, of data mesh across customers. Um, one of them tends to be where they're making the core kind of data product unit, essentially a, a, a table or a set of tables in the data warehouse. And they're wrestling through that semantic interoperability um, in terms of, you know, how data products have to be kind of approved in order to be part of their mesh framework. And so, so putting them through a set of standards um, around where particular fields need to be interoperable. And then I've seen another uh, end of the spectrum where people are defining more holistic data products, uh, it, more like the microservices movement where they're essentially um, building data product containers and um, making those containers kind of portable and interoperable. But that that feels like um, the the harder path to take right now and where there hasn't been very much sort of both, um, you know, thought leadership and, and progress technically. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So what if an organization over the past years has established their data management capabilities and even uh, organization according to the DEMA model, DMBOK, does your data mesh fit into DEMA thinking or would it mean a paradigm shift? I am going to, to channel Jamak, and I'm sure she would say paradigm shift because she loves that phrase. <laughs> I'm teasing you now. I don't even know her. It's a paradigm shift of socio... Well, she has a lot of great words. Um, so I think part of it is, is a paradigm shift of thinking data as a product. I, I Again, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical, but you could say master data management, I guess, by some of the definitions is a, um, is a data... A, product or they data march, right? Or, or it might be a way of, uh, I don't know where folks are on the DEMA DMBOK model. I mean, I think there's some mapping to the concepts. I mean, I think even um, Demog said that, you know, we should, we're renaming some of the things we've been doing for a while. It's just more of a new way of thinking, right? So, you know, maybe if you do have too much of a rigid data governance, it is maybe more of a federated data governance approach, um, something to look at. So, yeah, I think a lot of this is kind of here we go, meshing things together that um, yeah. we've used before. But I do think, um, yeah, there, there's some new approaches that still need to be tested, I would say, back to my uh, Michael Phelps analogy. <laughs> Sorry, I'm interested in what Jeff and Shane have to say. I think you're right. I, I, you know, I, of the, uh, it is paradigm shift, and we're still looking for you know a variety of different paradigms, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with Dama, but it, it sounds like a paradigm shift. I'll agree. Plus one. Perfect. So um, do you have some examples of technologies used to achieve successful implementation of data mesh? I'm going to practice, pass it to the product guys first on this one, if you guys want to take the first one on those. Um, Shane, do you want to? Yeah, no. let, let Shane, Shane go first, because my observation is it's still a, an amalgam of all kinds of different stuff right now. And, you know, even when I'm looking at 
my partners in the cloud and things like that, that uh, uh, there's so many still moving parts in this in this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'd say typically um, uh, when I'm seeing customers go down this path, the, the sort of foundation is the cloud data warehouse, you know, the, the Snowflake, BigQuery, uh, Databricks, et cetera. Um, and then on top of that, uh, and obviously you have the, the sort of transformation and ingestion and, and uh, scheduling tools like Fivetran, DBT, Airflow. But typically the layer they're adding on to enable data mesh is um, both the catalog, so something like Alation or Atlan uh, are some of the common ones. There's one called data.world, but some of these newer catalogs that enable data discovery across a wider organization. Uh, and then I'd say observability tooling, you know, given these principles around a data product are uh, discovery, trust, interoperability, um, often it's the catalog and the data observability tooling that, that they're using to sort of build out that um, standard for, for data products. Great. No, I mean, I think that's fair. I mean, I think some of the nebulousness is, is what makes it, it hard, right? That what I think we need to agree on what some of these core terms. I mean, I think some of the, you know, we, we didn't talk about data fabric, but I think some of the data virtualization and those kind of technologies are also kind of a component of this, that it's not necessarily even stored in one place, but you can kind of tie into these different products to get the full view. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we've got four minutes left, so I think we got time for at least one more question. So how granular should a data product be? For example, for cross-domain address products, should those be considered products in a supply chain? Cross-domain address product. I mean, well, part of my my issue, my, my little mini rant I had there, that I think that concept of domain um, is too loosely defined. I mean, in some case, many of the examples, a domain was an entire a business area like finance was a domain right right and in some areas customers a domain which to me feels like master data and that that's my one of my issues with that that architectural quantum i'm sorry i have problems with that word the architectural quantum is too high grained uh, it just like finance is a whole product like what i can't even imagine what that means that's the, that's the domain area the 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 single thing that maybe a product is an order right or a customer or vendor right to me that's how i think about it I'm, again i'm not a data mesh person I'm, I'm gonna channeling it here but um that that's one of my issues i think it's way too loose in terms of what that domain means but opening up to, to no, i, I, I think i think that's correct and that you know there may be a quote-unquote owner of your order or of your customer but um it's i think the granularity of you know of, of where that you know, domain kind of exists is uh, is lower than the you know, the finance department, right? There's an order. The fi you know, the finance would own an offshoot of that, like the invoice. But um, uh, yeah, I think that the the the, the terminology um, still does need some more refinement of you know at what level at what scope do you, you know are are you applying it to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I just say like I think um, you know unless you've got a very simplistic business most people are defining some source aligned domains so that might be um you know commerce or or advertising or something like that and then they're defining more kind of cross domain products and consumer aligned domains and so even in in my time at the times you know subscription data was a cross domain product that then fed that was managed centrally and fed into a lot of downstream products and so i do see most teams um, still managing some central data products for the organization, even as they're pushing into these mesh-like frameworks. So there, very few times have I seen um, full decentralization of, of data product development. Yeah, that's fair. And I think even in some of the examples in early mesh, it was something very simple, like a podcast company or someone owns, you know, web clicks and someone owns podcast publication, you know, it, it's hard to find a use case where there isn't a cross-functional and they do exist you know maybe it is it you know web web traffic clicks i own it but um, yeah I, I think that as it scales it's a little harder to to find something that's not cross-functional mm -hmm. all right shannon do we have time for one more or are we done can you tell us i think that's it that's actually perfect oh, timing okay. i know 
<laughs> so many great questions coming in, but uh, that is all the time we have for this webinar. Thank you so much to Couchbase and to Monte Carlo for sponsoring today's webinar to help make these webinars happen. And thanks to all of our attendees who have been so engaged in everything again, uh, as we do. I love all the chat and the questions that have gone on throughout the day. Uh, and uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thanks, y'all. Hope y'all have a very good day. Great. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Donna. Thank you.